welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the third annual Dr. Alice P. Lynn Memorial Lecture. My name is Melissa Begg and I have the great honor and pleasure of being the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. Now in its third year, uh, the Lynn Lecture gives us an opportunity to hear from renowned leaders on research issues and trends in public policy and administration. It's a wonderful chance for our community to engage with the ideas that are shaping the future of social welfare. The Lynn Lecture and the Lynn Doctoral Scholarship were created by Dr. Nan Lynn to honor the memory of Alice, his wife of 48 years. Dr. Alice P. Lynn was born in Chengdu, China and raised in Taiwan. She immigrated to the United States in 1964, receiving her master's degree in social work from the University of Michigan. She earned her doctorate from the Columbia School of Social Work in 1985. After completing her doctorate, Dr. Alice Lynn enjoyed an illustrious and impactful career in social welfare administration. She served as deputy commissioner for the New York State Office of Mental Health, as a professor at Duke University Fuqua School of Business, and as a consultant to local governments across the country. She was a proud Columbia alum, and her service to the school included eight years as president of our Dean's Advisory Board. Dr. Lynn published a memoir before her untimely passing in 2015. In it, she stated, the very survival and growth of humankind depends on how the races and nations live and work together and how men and women learn to share the same dreams. I can think of no other sentiment that captures the current moment and the challenges ahead. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Nan Lin, Alice's husband and their son Ho Lin and other family members who've joined us today. Thank you for making this possible. Now, I have the great pleasure of introducing today's eminent speaker. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Sharita Butler Barnes to share her important research. Dr. Butler Barnes is an associate professor of social work at the George Warren Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, where she was awarded tenure in 2017. As both a developmental psychologist and a quantitative methodologist, Dr. Butler Barnes' research examines how black youth draw on individual and cultural assets and resources to thrive despite challenges to their identities from structural, individual, and cultural racism. Her expertise and scholarly work focus on black children and youth, risk and resilience, academic achievement and well being. Dr. Butler Barnes also has extensive experience in youth programming and advancing equitable learning environments for black adolescent girls. Her important work is receiving increasing attention nationally for both its rigor and also its promise in pointing to an actionable path forward to improve educational and health outcomes of Black Americans. Dr. Butler Barnes received her bachelor's degree in psychology from Michigan State University and her MA and PhD degrees in developmental psychology from Wayne State University. She completed postdoc work at High Scope Educational Research Foundation and was a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan, affiliated with the Center for the Study of Black Youth in Context. I'm also pleased to introduce tonight's moderator and a truly wonderful colleague, Dr. Desmond Patton. Dr. Patton is Associate Professor of Social Work and Associate Dean for Curriculum Innovation and Academic Affairs here at Columbia Social Work. His research inter interrogates pathways to violence, both online and off, in unique ways. He takes an innovative approach using qualitative and computational data methods to study how and why violence, grief, and identity are expressed on social media and the impact these expressions have on well being, especially among low income youth of color. Dr. Patton's a member of the Columbia Data Science Institute, where he was recently named Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And at our school, Dr. Patton has played leadership roles with a number of exciting initiatives, including the Safe Lab. AI for All, the Action Lab for Social Justice, and so much more. Dr. Butler Barnes, we are all really proud to host you uh, as the 2021 Lynn Lecturer and eager to hear more about your work. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Thank you. I am now going to share my screen. And so thank you all again, the audience. I wanna thank you all for um, joining this Zoom lecture today. I am very excited to talk about some of the work that I've been engaged in. But before I get started talking, uh, giving this presentation, I would like to send a warm welcome to Dr. Lynn's family. Her scholarship, her research and commitment to the community is unparalleled. Thank you again for having me. Today's talk, I am going to be talking about what's going on 
COVID-19, racial justice, and the virtual learning experiences of Black youth. Again, I am Sharita Butler-Barnes and I'm an associate professor at WashU. And so for this talk, we are going to be talking about a couple of things. I wanna present an overview. And so I'm gonna be talking about Black families and the COVID-19 pandemic, the invisibility of Black youth and the conversation and voices in this story, Black youth activism, COVID-19 and virtual learning experiences, and syndemic theory. We're gonna be presenting findings and implication for one's practice. And so Black families and the COVID pandemic. This has been information that has been televised. We've seen it on our news stations. We've heard it on radio stations. We've seen it in social media. We know that Black populations are devastated in the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the United States, they've been particularly devastated. To date in the US, Black Americans are more likely to die from COVID-19. And also the pandemic has taken a financial toll on Black American families throughout the US. For instance, Black Americans are losing their jobs and are more likely to serve as these essential workers. And so we know that there is not only Black families that are devastated in ways, but it has an impact on economics as well. And so to date, Black Americans account for 15% of the COVID deaths. Black Americans are also more likely to experience death of a family member in comparison to white families. And so this intersection of grief and crisis exacerbates ongoing health, education, and economic disparities. And so these things sort of exacerbates, puts a lens on what's already been an issue such as our health, our education, and our economic disparities. And so how do Black youth show up to this work? We know a lot about the research, we know a lot about the findings, but we haven't really been centering Black youth voice. And so this goes back to the title, what's going on? And so based on adolescent social positioning of who they are, their race, ethnicity, class, and gender, these things are associated with the type of experiences that adolescents encounter on a daily basis. And so one of these experiences is racism. And so in a racially stratified and oppressive society, black youth grow up and must figure out who they are, what they can achieve while navigating these dehumanizing stereotypes that consistently devalue and disregard black lives. And so these realities are intensified at the intersection of race, class, and gender. And so really to put emphasis on this, we've been talking a lot about black families. We have statistics on black families, but how are youth coping in a society that's racially stratified and oppressive coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic? And so the invisibility of the black youth pandemic is a very real one. And so what we know from the research findings and even from my own statistics in the state of Missouri, it's that black adolescents are more likely to contract the virus, but we've not been having these particularly conversations. We've not been having these conversations. And so just from this chart alone, if we focus on the ages of 10 to 19, we see that African-American children have some of the highest reports of COVID, but yet we're not having conversations with how youth are actually doing at this time. And so COVID-19 and trauma, there are mental health struggles among teens as well due to social isolation, feelings of sadness, anxiety, and depression, coupled with the racial injustice that's been happening in society. In society. And so I ask you all again, what's going on? And so racial discrimination is a common occurrence for African-American adolescents. On average, adoles African-American adolescents perceive more than five racial discrimination experiences per day. And let me just sort of go further into this finding. It's not that these experiences only involve these sort of personal racial discrimination experiences, but they also include vicarious racial discrimination experiences. So hearing others say negative things about one's racial or ethnic group. So this is on average five times per day. And I do I need to underscore the fact that this is also intersecting with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so black youth activism, where does this come in at? 
So based on adolescents' various social identities, their race, gender, and their sexual orientation, this informs their worldviews and pro-social behaviors as emerging adults about who they are. Prior scholarship also suggests that the sociopolitical development process that Black adolescents are engaged in deepens their awareness of how systemic factors and structures promote inequitable outcomes in society. So it's during this awareness, this experience with racism on a day-to-day -day basis sort of, sort of sharpens their awareness of how systemic factors and structures operate for them in real time. And so what we do know is that Black activism serves as a coping mechanism in resisting inequalities. And so some of the things that I've spoken about earlier, such as racism, regardless if it's this sort of direct interpersonal experiences, vicarious racism, these experiences and activism sort of serves as a coping mechanism in resisting these narratives. And we have others that found that perceptions of societal inequality predicts voting, conventional political action and social action for black adolescents. And according to additional colleagues, black adolescents lives are rooted within specific social cultures experiences. So these homes, schools and neighborhoods that contribute to their development. And so again, adolescents are just not isolated but they're in these settings that promote or inhibit positive well-being. And so with regards to COVID-19 and virtual learning, majority of the research literature, very important work, but some of it has been geared towards understanding quality instruction. Again, very important. Um, what are parental expectations around this? What is um, student access? This whole idea of digital divide, the impact on teacher workload and the importance of individualized instruction, particularly focused on students with special needs. And also, which we've been talking a lot about parental concerns about the reopening of schools. And so these are all important issues that need to be addressed. They're very, very important. But again, what's going on? How are you sort of processing the COVID-19 pandemic, virtual learning experiences, and also the racial injustices that are happening? And so one of the studies that really got at this idea of centering youth voice was conducted by Ray Lake and colleagues. And she examined how adolescents spent their time during COVID-19 on 14 different types of activities. And so these activities were like social media, civic engagement, work and family time, just to give you all a few examples. And so she found three unique groups that were identified. There were a group of adolescents that were education focused. There were a group of adolescents that tended to use the media a lot um, for their own purposes, but also to communicate with their peers. And there were adolescents, the third group, who was a work-focused group. And this particular study is important because it's one of the first that actually centered adolescents' voices by sort of understanding, trying to examine and understand their lived experience and how they spent their time during a COVID-19 pandemic. And so one of the ways in which I wanted to build upon this research literature was to look at these clustering of stressors within the environment that is exacerbated by systemic factors. And one of the things that we pull on, one of the theories is syndemic theory. And so being very much interested in a COVID-19 pandemic, racism and black youth. And so these syndemic conditions such as a change in schooling, virtual learning, the COVID related stressors, having indirect exposure to COVID-19 and experience due to death and racism every day and vicarious experiences, they're very important to understand the impact on black youth's virtual learning experiences. And so again, this refers to a clustering of stressors, right? So this is a territory of unknown. Um, we've not examined how black youth are coping with both. Um, there's been no studies to date to my knowledge that have contributed to this work. And so for me, I wanted to ask the question, what's going on with our particular youth at this time? And so the current study, I was interested in four things. I wanted to understand black youth experiences in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, their racial discrimination experiences and virtual learning. 
I also wanted to understand Black youth experiences and their adaptability to the COVID-19 pandemic. And by adaptability to the COVID-19 pandemic is pretty much how are they coping, what are the support systems that they have during this time, and how readily available do they feel like these resources are. And as I move further, I'll talk a little bit about um, what went into that um, scale, those items that um, went into that scale. And so also the important role of social support. Um, I like to preference this with that. Although we know that these are negative experiences, right? COVID-19 pandemic, um, racial injustice, I still think it's important for us to identify social support systems, strength-based um, assets that adolescents have access to during this time, because this is where we begin to understand where additional programming can look like, what do mentors and other social support um, systems offer. And so the role of social support, but not only just social support, but also the virtual relationship with peers online adults in school setting. So it's these virtual relationships that adolescents have to adjust to during virtual learning. What are these support systems that are available to them while they're engaging in online instruction? And then lastly, based on previous literatures, I was interested in how COVID-19 and racism influence Black youth activism. In what ways did this lead to adolescents wanting to be more um, um, politically involved? What social action did this lead to? And so all of these things are very important questions because they're centered in real time with what some of our youth are coping with today. And so I wanted to present just two models visually. And so what I'm examining is COVID-19 stressors. And as I move forward, I will discuss what that looks like. Um, later on in the slides. Online racism. I'll go into what comprises that scale. What is COVID-19 stressors and online racism? What is the impact on COVID-19 adaptability? And also what role just virtual school connection, having a support of adult in school and virtual peer support, in what ways does it moderate the relationship between the two? And so that was the first set of um, research questions that I was very much interested in. And so the second one centered still around COVID-19 stressors and online racism, but the impact on Black youth activism. How did these experiences increase the sort and types of activism that Black youth were engaging in? And again, what was the role of the school connection and peer support virtually? What did that look like? And so ongoing data collection. So this is a study that I am, um, that's ongoing. We're right now in the middle of collecting data as we speak. And so right now to date, we have um, 123 black youth from a Midwestern school district. Adolescents age range from 12 to 18 years of age. The mean age was 15. 63% of the sample were girls. Participants were given a $10 incentive and the school district Overall qualified, 99% of those students qualified for free and reduced lunch. And so this is ongoing data collection. Our numbers are still moving up, but I was very excited to talk about some of the findings that we have um, today because I think it's very important and it's definitely a starting point. And so what were some of these predictors, right? And so let's talk a little bit about what went into this COVID stress scale. And so this is a scale that comprises six items. And two of the sample questions are, to what extent are you worried about how COVID-19 will impact your school year? And to what extent are you worried about how COVID-19 will impact you feeling connected to your friends? The alpha for this scale was 0.76. The next scale, online racial discrimination scale, this comprised seven items. Two of the sample items are, people have said mean or rude things about me because of my race or ethnic group online. And people have said things that were untrue about people in my race or ethnic group online. What's interesting about this particular scale is that it not only encompasses individual personal experiences of racism, but also vicarious racism, um, vicarious racial discrimination experiences as well, being that people 
can, adolescents can still be impacted by persons who are saying something untrue about persons in their race or ethnic group. And so um, this was very important for me because adolescents are not in their school setting in their school context, but because they spend majority of their time online as social media users, it is the case that in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and also racial injustice, that adolescents are seeing and hearing messages about them through this format, especially as we're all virtual learning at this time. And so what were the moderators? Again, interested in support systems. And so number one, we used the Student Resilience Survey. And so this was comprised of two subscales that I used, um, the Peer Connection Subscale and the School Connection Subscale. The Peer Connection Subscale was comprised of 12 items. Some of those sample items are, there are stu students during virtual online school who would choose you on their team during an online activity. And there are students during virtual online school who would miss you if you did not attend online school. And so this is particularly important because these items got at the types of relationships that peers had virtually. We know that COVID-19 has disrupted some of these in-person meetings, extracurricular activities, um, have um, sort of gone out with some school districts um, depending on the COVID-19. Um, rates within that particular um, school district, but we wanted to understand what was that peer connection like for that peer while you're on school virtually for you and that for the adolescent and their peers. And so also we was interested in school connection. So this was one where we were very much interested in virtually, is there an adult who really cares about the adolescent? And also, Virtually, there is an adult who listens to me when I have something to say. And so this was identifying a supportive adult virtually during the day that was there so that adolescents can speak and talk to them about problems they were having. And so this was, you know, going to them to share um, um, stories of discomfort, um, asking questions and getting advice. And so this is the way that these questions were sort of situated and really asking about adult support within um, a virtual learning environment. And so three outcomes that I wanna talk about, they're both activism, um, but two of them are activism and one is adaptability. And so let's first talk about the COVID-19 adaptability scale. And so a lot of the work on COVID has been centered on um, teacher expectations and you know instructional strategies um, digital divide all of those issues are particularly important but i was more so interested in how students are behaving in this time and how they feel like they can sort of persevere from what's happening around COVID. And so this scale comprised six items and it had more to do with the cognitive, cognitive behavioral aspect. I am able to think through a number of possible options to assist me in the COVID-19 pandemic. I am able to seek out new information, helpful people or useful resources to effectively deal with the COVID, with the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. And so the black activism scale I use, but there are two subscales that I use from this particular scale, the black community activism. And one of them is the low risk orientation. And so this comprised 11 items and some of the sample questions are, I displayed a poster or bumper sticker with a political message specific to the black community. And I present facts to challenge another person's social or political statement about the black community. And so this is deemed low risk orientation because these persons their form of activism is through educating and through wearing t-shirts or maybe bumper stickers um, and just being support, whether they're on blogs or they're online and really being an ally and stepping up and, and, and showing up in various ways for the black community. And so also the black community activism orientation scale also encompasses high risk um, um, orientation. And this really got at activism that is high risk. And so some of the questions, I engage in political activity related to the black community in which I know I would be arrested. 
I engage in political activity specific to the Black community in which I suspect there would be a confrontation with the police or possible arrest. Both of these are different, are activism, but different types of activism. And again, I was interested in the intersections of COVID-19, um, racial injustice, and the ways in which not only it shaped the virtual learning experience outcomes of Black adolescents, but also their involvement in activism, uh, you know, addressing racial injustice at this time. And so what are some of the means and standard deviations? Is there some of them I wanna point out to you, which was you know, sort of alarming for me. And so overall we have adolescents, minimum age, mean age 15, um, online racial discrimination, um, the mean average is around 2.7. So there were some experiences of, um, of, of encountering sort of these vicarious and sort of individual personal experiences. Um, the sample also tended to high, have higher averages on peer connection, their school connection, their adaptability. They were able to sort of cope with some of these um, um, stressors that they had low risk activism and high risk activism. Um, also, we're sort of low to moderately in terms of how we look at the average and you all look at the range. But what's particularly interesting is looking at the COVID-19 stressors. So we see the range is zero to three, but on average for the sample, they're almost at a three. Three was the highest to insane that you are very much stressed about what's going on. And so we see that among this sample of 123 adolescents, the stressors related to COVID and some of these items that I did not talk about earlier also encompass questions about, I am worried about my family's finances. I am worried about um, my involvement or my connection to my peers. I am worried about the school year. And so this is a very real thing for Black adolescents and I just wanted to bring attention to that. And so I ran a general linear um, um, model, a GLM multivariate model. The first outcome, and so I'm presenting these in three tables, even though I ran this as one big model, but for visibility purposes, I think it's important that I go through and explain each of the tables and the findings associated with that. And so what we tend to see is that if you all can look at the virtual school connection here, we see that for Black youth who reported having an adult in their life, having an important adult virtually to talk to, this was associated with them positively coping with COVID-19 adaptability. And so they were more likely to problem solve. They were more likely to seek out assistance. They were more likely to seek out information if they needed it. Having that virtual school connection was particularly important. And also there was a significant online racial discrimination by a school connection. And I'm gonna show what that means as we probe further to look at these findings. And so what we see is that when black youth are reporting higher levels of online racial discrimination experiences, those youth who also report having higher connections with adults through their virtual learning environment they tended to cope with COVID-19 better, that adaptability. They were more likely to feel hopeful. They were more likely to feel as if they could problem solve when presented with an issue that centered around the COVID-19 pandemic. And so in this case, I want to underscore the importance of support systems within schools virtually, that online mentorship and experience matters. And so what we see here for low risk activism, and so this is a form of the black activism scale, we see a couple of things. And so we see that gender is significant. And so what we found was that for black girls, they were more likely to be engaged in low risk activism. So um, um, contributing to conversations around um, racial equity and social justice, um, resisting stereotypes, more likely to you know, wear a button, um, more likely to correct someone when someone gives inappropriate or inaccurate information about a member from their racial or ethnic group. Black girls were more likely to engage in this form of activism. And so we also have a marginal significance here, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, we're almost significant, but not quite. And so when we get to high risk activism, we see a lot of the variables here that are particularly important. And so 
a, a, a couple of them that we're going to walk through. The first is online racial discrimination. And so we see here that our finding corroborates previous literatures and that Black youth who report experiencing higher levels of online racial discrimination, they were more likely to be engaged in high risk activism. So this is knowing that they could potentially be arrested, knowing that they could potentially have a negative encounter with the police officer, these online racial discrimination experiences. We also have virtual peer connection. Adolescents who had supportive peers to talk to about their problems, who had supportive peers that were in their corner virtually, they were more likely to engage in high-risk activism as well too. But what's interesting, what's interesting about this is that for adolescents reporting having higher levels of school connection, meaning adults in their environment, they were less likely to engage in high risk, high risk activism. And so in the um, conclusion, I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that is. And so really to sum this up, just these sort of direct effects, we see that Black youth who experience online racial discrimination, they are more likely to be engaged in high risk activism. We also see that if you have support from peers, not necessarily support for high risk activism, but also just support in, I can share things with someone virtually online. I have a peer I can share things with. I know that um, this peer is going to, my friend is going to reach out to me if they don't see me during online school. I know that I have someone who I can talk to and who is supportive of me. Things, the, 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 these questions were associated with youth reporting high levels of activism. And so also the school connection, again, if you have an adult that's there, that's very responsive to you, that's talking, you are more, you are less likely to engage in high risk activism. And so these last two variables that I want to sort of highlight are some interaction effects. And just to probe further, I want to show you all what those meant. And so again, this is just sort of underscoring what I previously stated. So for Black youth who are experiencing higher levels of online racial discrimination, if they have peers who are supporting them virtually, that are making sure that their needs are met, that they have an emotional connection to, they are engaging in high-risk activism, OK? And then this is the direct opposite for those persons, those adults in their environment. If they are experiencing higher levels of online racism, if they have a low virtual school connection, meaning they don't, they're not talking to any adults, there aren't um, any adults that are available, little to no adults available, they are engaging in high risk activism. And so I think the important take home point about these virtual learning experiences are a couple of things. We know that COVID-19 racial injustices presents unique stressors for Black adolescents in school settings, particularly through virtual learning. But it's also important that we highlight the various forms of relationships that are supportive for Black youth in this context. And so these are some of the beginning findings um, that I found. Um, and I would like to talk about these a little bit further and sort of implications for where the work is going and the practice implications as well too. And so when we talk about conclusions, Black youth and COVID-19 stressors, the main thing, the main take home point that I think we all have to be alarmed about is the fact that Black youth in this sample reported high levels of stress. And so we have to think about the expectations that we have for youth in these settings, this idea of still continuing to go with normality when things are not normal, is testing appropriate at this time, but how are, really, how are we centering youth voices during this pandemic? And so some of the variables that I have italicized some of these um, statements, the importance of feeling connected to friends, that was particularly important for adolescents. The impact, the COVID-19 impact on their school year. And also a big one, family finances. It's important that we understand that all of the statistics that we've highlighted around Black families and the way in which they are more likely to be devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic, this has a direct impact on their children. And so if adolescents are expected to learn in an environment still be academically studious, somehow have coping mechanisms to deal with racial injustices that occur to them every single day, five times per day, as the research shows, 
also different forms of racial discrimination experiences, but then they also have to be worried about their family finances as well. This is going to have a detrimental impact on our academic achievement when we look at these findings or these numbers five to 10 years from now. And so what I really wanted to underscore though is how this work contributes to existing literatures is that it's not only important to look at how adolescents spend their time, I think that's very useful in terms of understanding that we have those who um, are, are more likely to be education-based, those persons who are more likely to be work-oriented and those persons who are more likely to be social media users, but also that relationships matter and are important for Black youth in a virtual learning setting. And so when we get to COVID-19 adaptability, being connected to school matters. And this was associated with you feeling as if they can adapt. Um, look at the bright side of things when dealing with COVID. And a lot of these questions had to deal with, um, I feel as if there are, you know, I can, I, you know, I, I, I can be hopeful. Um, I'm able to problem solve. I'm able to seek assistance when I need to seek that. But that was especially important for the role of that adult in that virtual learning environment to sort of assist Black youth on that trajectory. And so when we also have Black youth in low risk activism, and so this is particularly important because I want to highlight that this work, the finding particularly around Black girls um, were more likely to be involved in low risk activism. And so this corroborates previous literatures on Black girls in academic spaces and settings um, resisting negative messaging and stereotypes, actively doing these things. And so, however, I do want to caution about the sample size. This is ongoing data collection, um, and also the sample was 63% female. And so it's important to balance that out gender-wise and to sort of further probe what's going on and really, be, really do some gender analysis and really trying to understand the types of activism that Black boys and Black girls are involved in. But overall, these findings corroborate previous studies that note that Black activism serves as a coping mechanism in resisting inequalities. And so if adolescents are experiencing racial discrimination experienced vicariously, individually, they are more likely to be active. They, they're going to engage in some form of activism. And so when we get to Black youth and high-risk activism, um, online racial discrimination was associated with greater, particip greater participation. Virtual peer support was associated with greater participation in high-risk activism, but virtual school connection was indicative of lower participation. And so I speculate there could be a couple of things going on. It could be the case that youth who have adults who are speaking to adults about this, these adults could be telling them the sort of cons in engaging in the sort of high risk activism, if it's going to lead black youth to jail, right? To, 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 you know, to get arrested. And so I think these messages from, you, from adults could be safety measures, right? When we think about the important role of racial socialization as well. So I think that could be going on here. But also, there can also be a different type of communication. We need to consider the types of communication from adults in that environment. They could just be discouraging participation in high-risk activism that mirrors their own lived experiences that differs by one's racial ethnic background and their political views, especially when we bring up the role of, um, when we bring up the Black Lives Matter movement, how are adults sort of addressing these issues within context to Black adolescents in, in sort of talking about the different sort of high risk activism versus low risk activism. And so what we did find though overall is that school relationships matter for Black youth when experiencing online racism. And so this was particularly important. So again, I think this work also um, has implications for identifying other social support systems and other ways how schools can be supportive virtually and really promoting healthy development among Black youth. And so where do we go from where? How do we support Black youth in moving forward? And so one of the things that I think is imperative that we have to do is we have to center youth voice in decision making. We have to do this. I understand that we are in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. I understand that teachers are taxed. I understand that school districts are trying to make it, but there needs to be spaces for black youth 
to talk about the intersection of COVID-19 and experiencing racial injustice, the consistency of these experiences, and also this adaption to virtual learning, right? Because coupled with the loneliness um, and the depression that comes from that, Black youth in this sample had, are worried about families' finances. They're worried about their peer relationships. They're worried about what this is going to have on their academic school year. And so I think this is very important. And so this means that we should be flexible with class time and structure. How are we allowing youth to have space? Um, are we being intentional about creating safe spaces? And also we have to address racial and social justice topic discussions in a classroom. We have to do this, but we have to do this in a way that we're not taxing Black adolescents. And so what I mean by that is that Black adolescents cannot be in these spaces explaining to persons that are very different from them about what's going on in this environment while they're actually living through it. And so the oppressed knows more about the oppressor and in these situations is going to take everybody of all different racial and ethnic backgrounds to be at the table in order for us to sort of move together around racial and social justice without taxing black adolescents. I think it's also important that we consider youth advisory boards. There are some school districts who are engaged in this. What does this look like? Having interested youth serve on advisory boards to be a liaison between themselves and the administrators. Um, so that they are able to sort of reach out to their peers in real time so they can understand what is sort of what's going on, but then also what are the additional support systems that they might that, that, that they may need. And also what about mental wellness days and check ins. This can be because we know that teachers are very taxed in ways in which they're teaching a classroom and then they also have their own children at home virtual learning. And so we can be creative in creating peer to peer check ins peer-to-peer -peer mental wellness checks. This speaks at the importance of mental health curriculum early on so that we can be able to sort of understand what's going on. Creating youth leadership positions. Um, if an advisory board is not going to do, what about youth being in positions where they are able to sort of contribute to the curriculum? They're able to contribute to programming that centers their voices. And I think we have to be very intentional about finding additional support systems in that environment. And so what was interesting about this particular scale that I used was that it was very general. So it asked about support from adults. And so I do think it's important that we look at other sort of support systems systems, whether it be in a family, whether it be in the community where we have the important role of mentors. And so when we support Black youth, we want to do it from this space, okay? But we also want to be mindful of the challenges. And so one of the things that um, that's been talked about, but not as much, not as much, is the fact that if school districts um, receive poor funding and had a lack of resources before COVID-19, these issues are exacerbated now. And so this makes it especially difficult to sort of make sure that all students' needs are met. And so we need to make sure that we are letting our politicians know at the state and federal level about how school funding and resources are allocated, because in some instances, it might not be um, um, healthy to bring all kids back to a classroom that didn't have the resources to begin with, right? In the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. And so these are the challenges, the digital divide, right? When we wanna create these support groups, when we wanna create youth voice, there are some youth depending on urban, rural or suburban environments where that access to quality Wi-Fi might look, very, might look very different. And one of the challenges to this work is the cultural deficit lens this gap gazing that I would like to just spend a, a, some, some time talking about. So the challenge to this work is that we know that black families have faced an insurmountable amount of stressors, right? Since 1619, we know this. We know that black adolescents are experiencing at least five racial discrimination experiences per day. We know these things. We know what, this, what the statistics look like. However, we have to address our populations from a strength-based lens. And so we can't be so caught up in the numbers. I call it gap gazing, where we look at these numbers and then we see a child that might be a member of that particular racial ethnic group. And we're all of a sudden just sort of checking off 
every single require, re, re, requirement that they meet and saying that they're at risk. And so we have to sort of deviate from a cultural deficit lens if we really wanna support youth um, at this time. We know the devastating impact of COVID-19. We know the impact of racial injustices, but what are our solutions? How do we move forward from it? We also have to address teacher biases and stereotypes, particularly when we, it's, when we talk to school districts um, and, and practitioners about having youth-led conversations or making space in classrooms, whether it be in person or virtually, about issues that are impacting society, such as the racial injustice, right? The COVID-19 pandemic, we really have to address teacher bias and stereotypes. This is where we have to be very reflective about the lived experiences that we bring to the table, especially with the populations that we serve. And so these are things that we have to be intentional about bringing up because it is our duty to promote positive youth development, whether it's through in-school person or whether it's through virtual learning environment. And another challenge is that there sometimes is an intentional avoidance of discussing racial justice issues. This might be because of one's upbringing or because of one's political views, or it may be one's own personal views. But I think that this work, particularly at this time now, in terms of what Black youth are going through, we have to call these things out. People have to be uncomfortable. And I think we have to be okay with that because we have to talk about racial justice issues and how they're impacting our youth today. And so problem solving strategies that lead to opportunities. And so one of the things that I wanna highlight is if you do not know what to do, okay? If you do not know what to do within a school setting, whether you are an educator or a practitioner or a researcher, what do you do when you have a pandemic that is devastating? a population um, on top of a population that has experienced systemic racism and equities, whether it do, is due to individual, cultural, or vicarious experiences of racism. Well, what you can do is do a needs assessment with purpose. And I add with purpose intentionally. The needs assessment is really to understand the intersectional experiences of Black adolescents. How do they show up? How are they coming to the table? How are they presenting themselves? Um, how do the administrators, teacher and staff feel? What are their experiences? What are they bringing to the table in serving these families, right? And students. And so I also wanna highlight family experiences. And so what do families have to say? What are the support systems that families have, right? Um, what does virtual um, um, learning look like when we have supportive parent involvement? Have we even had those discussions? What do we do about parents that have to work all day, right? That are not able to be at home and assist their child with virtual learning or just being able to monitor to make sure that they're completing their assignments. And so a needs assessment with purpose will sort of help you to talk to the people that we serve in terms of letting them, empowering them to tell us what they need. Partnerships with also youth serving community organizations are especially important because they do most of the work. When we think of out of school time, when we think of extracurricular activities, when we think of big brother, big sister mentor programs, we want to partner with youth serving communities in terms of looking at programming that they're doing to make sure that we're creating intentional space for black youth to thrive and to be successful partnership with local universities. Um, this may look very different, right? This might be engaging in a center that um, does work with families that um, um, is community engaged, that where you can be at the table and share resources. And I'm intentional about saying sharing resources as well, because we have to get rid of the power dynamics. When we talk about partnership with universities and the community, I think if everybody is at the table, and then we're asking folks what they need and what their experiences has, has been like, is going to take a team approach, a collectivism that I would like to call it in order to address these issues. And it's also important to identify mentors. And I have pre and during COVID-19 for a reason. And so 
because adolescents' lives have been so disrupted by COVID-19, I think it's important that we ask them what their support systems were before and who do they have to support them at this moment. This will sort of help us identify those who sort of are at risk and those persons who may not have all of the resources in order to develop that network again. And so I think mentors are especially important. And so I like to call this problem solving strategies that's leading to opportunities. And so strengths breaks practice. This involves a lot of the work that we have to do as practitioners and researchers and serve in our communities. The first is at our positionality. And this gets at, in order for us to understand the intersectional experiences of Black families, meaning family configuration, there's a deficit view, unfortunately, of Black families, um, understanding that Black families span ethnicity, but also socioeconomic status, that there are unique neighborhood and educational experiences. But then also the most important one is, what are practitioner, researchers, expectations, and experiences, meaning how do you show up to this work? What is your lived experience? What position do you have? Meaning your own social identities? How do you address this work? Most importantly, what does your work look like when you engage in these populations? Are you perpetuating a one-size-fits-all model with these various populations that you work with? Are you consistently using um, um, models, um, measures, assessments, and tools that are not culturally responsive, right? Are you sort of contributing to science to a cultural deficit view? When we talk about helping Black teens, particularly in, in, in the COVID-19 and racial um, injustice, both of these issues are particularly important and is concerned and, 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 and is a crisis we have to be very intentional about doing self-reflection as well. Because if we, you know, it's kind of like the airplane, you know, when you get on an airplane, they say, if you don't secure your own oxygen, ma oxygen mask, you can't help others. This is the way that I view doing this work. And also culturally strength-based assets. How are we identifying those within our families? Racial identity, racial socialization, kin kinship, spirituality. How are we identifying family strengths at this time? Yes, we know the statistics that are associated with Black families, COVID-19, and racial injustice, we know that. But what are the culturally strength-based assets that families have that they can pull on that you can sort of incorporate in your own work, but also when you engage with this family? Are you giving them voice so that they feel like that this is an equal partnership at the table? How are you empowering these families? And I can also say that the intake assessment tools are particularly important too. Are they culturally appropriate? Right? Again, is it a one size fits all model? Are you part of an agency that has used this intake assessment for over 15 to 20 years um, without ever understanding how it's applicable to children from different racial or ethnic backgrounds? This is particularly important too. And so when we talk about strength-based work, it's not only um, the, the way in which we view populations, that's a major part of it but it's also the work that we do with ourselves in making sure that we are not harmful to communities, right? Sp especially when we know what black youth are, um, um, are going through at this moment right now. And this is just one school, one school that I was involved in, right? And so just think about nationally what, this, what these stressors um, may look like. And so that is the end of the presentation. Um, I, I didn't realize that I went through it that fast, but um, I would like to just give some acknowledgments. I would like to thank Dr. Lynn's family. Um, it's a, it, again, it's an honor. I would like to thank the Columbia University School of Social Work, the faculty, the children, youth, and families who I serve. Um, um, I, I, I work every day to sort of pay it forward for you all. Thank you all for the opportunity to let me tell your story. And also I would like to thank the audience for um, joining today. I am looking forward to your questions, your comments, um, and just anything else you have for me. Thank you again. Dr. Butler Barnes, thank you so very much for this riveting discussion. Um, First, I just want to thank you uh, for your care for our communities and for our children. Um, 
what I most appreciate about your work is the way in which you center Black youth experiences, that you help to lift their voices up, particularly in a time when our collective voices um, are oppressed and marginalized. So thank you for that. What I kept circling um, in my notes as you talked was the notion that relationships matter and that you recognize the power of relationships in both online and offline settings and that you have you bring about this awareness that our young people are living their lives online and mm -hmm. that there is an agentic quality to relationships and how those relationships can empower our young people for change to engage in activism in a way that also is therapeutic as they yes. maneuver uh, online discrimination. And I think that's innovative and it's powerful. So thank you so much for that work. Um, okay. I wanna open it up for Q and A now. Um, I'm gonna ask the first question and then yes. we have a series of questions in the chat as well. Oh, wow, um, okay, I'm yeah, ready. Everyone is in love with your work. Uh, so the first question that I have is, how might those involved in either practice or research assist children and youth during the pandemic and racial injustice? You know what, I think that we have to, one of the things that I think is very helpful is that we have to do active listening and we have to center youth voice. And so this means going into spaces and really just asking the question, how can I be of service? What's going on? Like I literally walk into places like, you know, what's up? What's going on? Tell me about how your day is going. Just the well-being of how you're feeling at that moment, that hopefulness, that aspiration. And so I let youth guide that discussion and what's talked about. And then I provide sort of solutions and resources there. But I want to create a space that they're able to share, you know, what's bothering them, if that makes sense. Yeah, that certainly goes. That sense, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, it, and, it, and it is in line with your practice of centering the Black experience and allowing people to speak yeah. for themselves. And something that I always think about in my own work is the expertise that Black youth bring to, to work, to research, to That's new right. ideas, to innovation. And I, and I think that that is a, a through line in your work. And uh, I'm sorry, and let me just course, add no, something please. else to that, Desmond. And what's also important about that is that this is like new territory. Yeah. Like for our before. youth. Yeah. <laughs> there are not there are no measures that capture this. Like I talked mm. a little bit about some of the measures that I was able to sort of find for my own work, but yeah. there are no like tools for this. And so we have to center youth voices to really listen to them and tell us what's going on. So yeah, I just yeah. wanted to add that. So there are some other really interesting questions that are in the Q&A that I want to throw your way mm -hmm. as well. So another participant asked, um, I know you mentioned that Black youth may use activism as a coping mechanism. Yeah. But I, all, but I was also wondering if you believe that there's a, a dichotomy in its impact, the emotional drainage that students might feel from having to constantly organize and advocate for their yeah. community to also be assessed to better understand how Black youth are being affected during this time. I think that's a wonderful question and I absolutely agree. I think that um, the scale that I use was Dr. Alon Hope's scale, um, Black Community Activism scale and some of the items I did not present, all of them, but she is very intentional about including different types of activism, whether it is writing a letter or if it is through poetry, if it's through, and so there are different forms in, in terms of resistance that black adolescents encounter. I was more so just interested in those, the sort of low risk and the high risk and sort of what was going on between those two. But I definitely think there are some risk. Um, there are some taxing um, properties to that. Like I always tell folks, you cannot tell people how to advocate, how to be activists. We can't do that. Everybody have their own sort of individual response and lived experience to that. So I think we just need to support however someone wants to resist. But I also think we need not to have these expectations, right? Because we have, have expectations for Black youth to tell folks what's going on. And then we want them to advocate, you know, act, advocate and, and, and um, be activists in certain ways. And so I think we need to, need to let them define it. So I absolutely I appreciate that question. Thank you for that. Yeah, and another question along those lines um, is, are you conceptualizing high-risk activism as a risk factor or perhaps as having a promotive or protective um, effect as well? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. 
I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm not sure yet because I'm very careful based on my own lived experience and how I center youth voice in trying to say that this high risk activism is a risk factor when black kids are living in a moment that I've not lived in. I don't want to be that person to have that voice for them. And so I think it's important that I test it in various ways. I think I would do that. But my own sort of personal opinion about it, I don't want to label it as being something that's that that's negative. I I, I don't I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be careful of doing that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I went back and forth about it because yeah. I can see whether the adults are saying you 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 want to be careful. You don't want to do A, B, C, and D. But I also understand that we're not at a, teenagers at this time either. Yeah, and I think you, know? you kept talking about what the stressors that teenagers are going through, especially as they are engaged in online virtual learning. And so it's not only just the educational piece, but it is the networking and peer piece. Absolutely. An additional stressor that young people who are in this adolescent development phase are trying to maneuver as well. So it's additional pressures that as adults, we get to kind of step away from. We understand the online piece because we're on Zoom 24 seven. Absolutely. This other connection is something that's really interesting as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not expected to keep friendships going. Yeah. We have to, you know, we have to, you know, kids are still taking tests. They're applying for college. You know, they're still expected to be with this normality in the midst of this, of a national like crisis. And so, yeah. yeah, and they're trying to maneuver it the best way they can and express, right? And so I don't know what that is going to look like. I think that is more additional work. I need a stronger sample, a larger sample size to just continue that. Because this is new territory. Absolutely. Um, our participants are, are really interested in knowing more about the racial composition of the student body in the schools and the faculties that you've studied as well. Absolutely. And so the racial composition of the school was predominantly um, Black, but it did, it, it it did have small percentages of indigenous and Latinx populations. The district had majority black teachers, majority African-American teachers. Got it, great. Uh, next question, you know, folks, I think really appreciated your next steps in your, in your thoughts around what do we do about this? Mm -hmm. This is a huge problem. We're, we're all concerned, what do we do? And so one of our participants said, I love this idea of peer-to-peer -peer wellness check-ins. We know that teens value the support of each other more than anything. Absolutely. What kinds of training or guidance would you recommend for the teens involved to help give them the language, skills, and support needed to have meaningful conversations during these check-ins? I think that's a great question. And one of the things that I've learned just through my own work is that I, I know you are like this is a this is a statement that she's making to every question, but let youth create it. Let it be developed and led by youth, right? Because they're going to be using the language. They need right. to own it, they need to define it. They all need to because the way that I define something, the curriculum that I might want them to use may be outdated. And it might not really be encompass sort of what's going on right now. And so bring you to the table, what does support look like? What does a check-in mean from your friend? What do they tell you and what do they do, right? And so those are the ways that we can stop. So I see a lot of narrative. I see a lot of conversations. And then we begin to let youth plan and develop it together. I think with this pandemic, I think with racial adjust, it has to be youth-led. It has to be youth-led. And we need to just be there to support. We yeah. To there to support. Yeah, you know, you're spot on. And I think that... I think, again, we, for some reason, we continue to underestimate the power of young people's ability to, to, to shape a world that works for them too, right? And to right. be extreme contributors in this space. And so it's just I mean, another aspect of the work that I really appreciate from you. No, and I appreciate, and, and, and you just made me think about Amanda Gorman's yep. poetry, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, just think <laughs> about youth voice. Yeah. In right. terms of what she's seen, she's a young lady, but just think about what brought her, what brought her to that moment, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to put those words. And so I just, we really underestimate our youth and I, mm -hmm. it should be definitely a great example. Friend. It's a great example. Mm -hmm. 
Another question for you is, um, we have, you know, a fabulous presentation and thank you so much. I'm really struck by your emphasis on centering Black youth voices. Yes. Is there a way that we can hear from Black youth about how to address the loss of a school year? This is a big yeah. question for policymakers. Absolutely. And so um, one of the, well, one of the things that I've seen that school districts actually want, if we are at universities, if we are practitioners is coming into space and sort of offering assistance, right? And so I think that that is something that we can definitely do. I think that school districts are open to that, open to partnering. And I think that's the ways in which we can, we can do that, right? How can we be of support to kids within um, um, that school setting or virtual learning? Because we are all trying to figure this out but I do think that there are strategic ways to center youth voice and to get other adults on board. It's just simply creating a safe space for black youth, but also being mindful of black youth go to schools in various different settings. Right. Right. But we also have to have the teacher biases and stereotypes or just administered that we sort of talked about. How can we sort of address that and talk to them about why centering youth voice is particularly important. Yeah. So we have to have buy-in. We yeah. have to have buy-in from administrators. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, neighborhood schools, in particular Black and Latinx communities that yes. have felt the brunt of COVID-19. So how might that, how might these experiences, these conversations shift and change is folks in the community are also coping with grief and loss and That's trauma. Right. And so can they have the same conversations that someone can have this in a neighborhood that hasn't been affected in the same way? Are, are right. we having equal conversations? And space has to be, it has to be intentional, safe space that's honoring, that's empowering, but also healing, right? Yeah. We can, you know, we can, we can create that, but I think this is what this is um, going to take. And it really gets at me, you know, not taxing Black youth. I, we can't do that. Yeah. yeah. The next question that we have for you is, uh, women have been highlighted at the forefront of the movement for racial equality, engaging in low and high risk activism. So thinking about yeah. the kinds of Black Lives Matter, Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris, Timika Mallory. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how has this been factored into your research given the large percentage of your, of your sample population identifying as girls? Also, yeah, so how has women empowerment impacted our, our youth girls, especially during the, uh, uh, these two pandemics? So that is a wonderful question. And so to that person that asked that majority of my research is actually on black girls um, and resistance and resilience. And so how black girls show, like, so we are very intentional about creating this sort of new body of literature around black girlhood. And that is really giving black girls space to define who they are and what they want to be, but also how they are resisting and sort of reframing these narratives about who they are and how they show up. Yeah. And so I think the way for me to sort of continue to, with that conversation, which is something I should have mentioned, but I, I want to eventually do some individual interviews, some focus group interviews with this population as well, so that they can define and name that. Because Black women have always sort of been at the, forefront of this. And so I want to see what Black girls view, feel about that, but also how they see themselves in that as well. Yeah, that's such a important point. And as you were talking, like the, the word that kept coming up for me is the power, the word that kept coming up for me is, um, is the power of narratives. Oh my and God, powerful. Narratives change heart and minds. Narratives yes. are important data points. They change policy. And how do we also kind of empower young black girls to understand the power of that narrative as well as a lever for change. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And I do, and you know, I think that um, the change comes in very different ways. And so, yeah. you know, the way in which they use their voice, I've heard narratives around black girls that are resisting the negative stereotypes and biases. No, I do not just do this. Do not look at social media and think A, B, C, and D. No, I have, higher educational expectations. Yeah. Oh, you know, despite these yeah. statistics, so being very verbal about and intentional about what's going on and just defining who they are. Yeah, absolutely. But again, centering youth voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always, always. 
Next oh. question. Uh, you mentioned cultural identity as a part of a strength-based perspective strategy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any co uh, curriculums or programs in mind to use with Black youth as a social skills group for Black youth? Absolutely. And so there are a couple that comes to mind. There's a Celebrating the Strengths of Black Youth Intervention. Um, that's one. There's also the Sister Nia Empowerment Program. Um, Faye Belgrave is one of the lead um, um, PIs on that amazing work is Sister Nia. And then I would also like to shout out Rihanna Anderson's work, the work that she's doing no around her recast. That's right, right? <laughs> around um, her, re you know, her work, what she's doing around racial socialization and having conversations around affirmation of identities with Black families, particularly in response to racial justice. And also Sean Jones. So there's a camp, there's a lot of interesting scholarship that's that's coming around um, in this work. It's a moment, it's a moment. It's a moment, it's a moment. Because yeah, we're always in these, in these spaces where folks are kind of like trying to identify great sources. And there are so many folks of color, black women, black men that are producing okay. excellent tools for us in this moment. So we have a lot okay. to move on. Uh, next question. Uh, you just mentioned the idea of applying for colleges and moving forward with, within the pandemic, but do you have any insight or predictions on the outcomes of the pandemic for black youth as they transition into adults? I think if we don't address what's going on, because see, one of the things we have to keep mindful of is that COVID-19 just sort of put a magnifier on already the existing disparities. Yeah. And so if we're not very intentional about addressing how this COVID-19 pandemic is impacting and disrupting learning, then we are going to have issues with making sure that our children are prepared for 21st century because it contributes to these ongoing educational disparities. We also have to make sure we hold our institutions accountable too. Yeah. So these anti-racist statements that organizations are putting out, it's organizations, universities, schools, we need for you to be action oriented and actually adhere to this moment because yeah. it's not just actionable, but it's also a lived experience what black youth are going through. So how are you gonna look at that black candidate that's coming through that door exactly. that have sort of lived in this moment? So this is what it means to actually be intentional about inclusion. Yeah, as you were talking, I think, it, so one of the nerdy things that I do is that I watch high school students um, open up their admissions uh, uh, letters on YouTube and they talk a lot yeah. about the process of applying to college and they apply to a range of colleges. And I'm seeing in these, in these new acceptances, black um, students talk about the challenges of applying to college in this COVID era as well. So there's another data point that's coming through is young mm. people using online venues to talk about the college admissions process too. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely implications for, you know, that's another area, you know, just we it, as you're talking, just so many untapped areas around youth development, emerging adulthood, where, you know, preparation of our kids, job force, um, university ready, that's significantly impacted by these moments. Absolutely. A lot of work that needs to be done. We have a challenge for you. Um, it oh says, with the research partners considering hosting a Zoom webinar featuring a Black youth-led dialogue? This would help create a model for us to learn from and possibly replicate. Is there someone I should follow up with to explore this possibility? Um, me? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, so you want to, you know, I think, so you, I'm sorry, I, I didn't really understand. So they want to know, is there someone to follow that will be able to so I, 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 Desmond? Yeah, of course. I think they're asking you if you would be willing to host a oh Zoom my gosh, yes. featuring Black Youth Dialogue and that this is a potential model that can be replicated across nonprofits and, uh, and uh, organizations. So yeah, I think that's the- Absolutely, that's the I will be open and willing um, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I would be open and willing to do that because that's what needs to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. great, great, great. Thank you. And I'm just going to throw two more questions at you and then I'll turn it back over to Dean Begg. Yes. Um, the, the next question is, you mentioned that the response rate was 63% or 65% female. Yeah. Do you have any ideas to engage male students as you continue your research? Yeah, so 
wonderful question. I think that if I was in person, if we were able to meet in person, I think that I will be able to establish rapport yeah. in a very different way because I definitely be I definitely believe that the community we serve, meaning even our research participants, our staff should be reflected of that. But through Zoom, through Quatrics, the way I collected the data, that's very difficult. And I already felt like I was taxing some of the administrators by asking to send the, the survey out over and, 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 and over again. And so I think this time I'm going to be very intentional about it, just reminders. But that's sort of what I that's sort of what I'm limited to do. But if I had it, I would definitely go in there to make sure that I am intentionally including Black boys' voices in this narrative because it's very important and to make sure that I meet with the superintendents to, to, to find out, okay, what is a way that I can engage this population authentically or go with what I've been saying this entire time. Get a group of Black boys together and say, hey, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to talk about? Yeah. I'm right? Sure. And so I think that's one of the ways that I would approach that. Yeah. And then to follow up on that, and this will be our last question is, we are appropriately focusing on empowering Black girls and women, but are young Black men being, um, being ignored? Uh, but not equally supported and promoted. Interesting. And so um, usually the research literature is the other way. There's a lot of focus on Black boys. Yeah. And more recently, we've been starting to focus on Black girls. Yeah. But I do think that what we have to do is recognize that there are unique racialized and gendered experiences with both groups. We need to stop playing the oppression Olympics with both groups because both have unique experiences. Yeah. And I think that our programming should be reflective at that moment of who we want to serve. And so there are programs for black boys. I'm thinking of Pedro's work. I'm thinking of Sean Jones. Um, I'm thinking of um, Sean Harper. Oh my gosh, it's just so, it's it's a, Cesare. There are so many yeah. folks out there that are doing this work, Desmond. Um, so many folks that are doing this work. And so I think that it's room for both. I think it's room for both. And if you feel as if there's not enough space with that, I think that you should create it. Yeah. I think what I've learned from my own work is that um, a focus on black boys or black girls isn't doesn't preclude a conversation about the other, right? That's and right. Black, black boys and black girls live in communities together. And oftentimes when I would interview black boys about a topic, black girls would come up in that conversation as well. That's right. And, and it would prompt new questions and new ideas that I can also pursue with black girls. And so I think that um, we oftentimes forget that we are in community together and are sharing our lives together in very different ways and that um, there's room for all the above. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dr. Butler Barnes, thank you so very much. Thank you. For this conversation and, and, and you um, thoughtfully um, answering these questions. Uh, so thank you again. And I'm going to turn it back over to thank our- Thank you all. That was spectacular. Thanks. Thanks you. Mm -hmm. Thank you to both of you. What an innovative, insightful and inspiring uh, presentation, Dr. Butler Barnes. Really uh, mm -hmm. can't thank you enough. We really want to uh, express our gratitude, and that's been filling up uh, all the comments from from audience members as well. So a lot of appreciation out there for what you did, and 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 Dr. Patton too. Thanks for great moderating. Thank you, Desmond. Uh, Absolutely, it's a great conversation watching the dynamic between you two. Um, yeah. you, you you've given us so much to think about, and not just to think about, but to act on, uh, yes. which I think is critical. So. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you again, and thanks to the entire um, audience. Thanks, and best wishes to everybody Thank for uh, for being here, and uh, keep up the great work. It's fantastic. Thank you all.